Hello to one and all. Uh, in this online video, I'm going to be talking about a new topic called psychophysics. Uh, we're just going to touch upon the introduction of psychophysics uh, and how it's actually related to the concept of sensation, uh, which is something that you have probably read in psychology. I'm not sure how new this topic is to you, but uh, you would be required to be quite attentive for this session because uh, this topic is not really, um, it does not really appear in a lot of textbooks. So let's begin with uh, understanding psychophysics with first looking at the history of psychophysics. Now, um, when we look at the word psychophysics, we uh, we can understand that it can be broken down into two parts. Uh, the psycho aspect uh, is related to the mind and something that's not tangible or something that we cannot really grasp or hold. And the physics part is for something that is tangible, an object that is that physically exists. So we're talking about a connection between these two things and just keep this, this statement that I just said in mind, this explanation in mind throughout this video and everything will seem to be relatable and easy when I explain the concepts further. So uh, the picture that you see here is of a man by the name of Theodor Gustav Fechner and he was a German um, psychologist and a researcher. He is known as the father of psychophysics. So there are a lot of techniques and there are a lot of theories which were formulated in the 1860s uh, for psychophysics by Gustav Fechner. He was the one who coined the term psychophysics and uh, in his research, he thought that physical stimuli in the environment could be connected to aspects of our consciousness. Again, I'm bringing you back to the explanation of how I broke down psychophysics for you. Psycho, which means the aspects of consciousness. We're looking at some things from the mind. And we're looking at physics, which are physical stimuli. So I'm going to repeat myself. He thought that there are strong relations which can be studied between physical stimuli in the environment and aspects of one's own consciousness. Now, what aspects are we looking at? When I said there is a connection between the matter and the mind. So, ideally, I would say um, that I have a sensation of uh, something that I feel when I see an object and I know how it feels, I know how heavy or light it is, I know the color of it, I know the shape of it. So matter is everything that's fit, that exists physically in this theory and the impressions that are formed after interacting with this object or matter forms in the mind. And that's what we are constantly going to look at in this video. Okay, so Gustav Fechner was uh, strongly inspired by Ernest Weber's work. He was a German physiologist and uh, he was uh, strongly inspired by all the kinds of experiments and the results on the sense of touch, which was uh, studied in the 1830s by Weber. And it was Weber's work who formed one of the bases of psychology to make it a science. All right. So now we're looking at actually the sense of touch. So as, as, a, as a researcher, Fechner wanted to develop a method to, uh, to be uh, able to relate mind and matter together by connecting the outside world which is observable all the objects all the things that we see in the outside world which are observable to the human eye and 
the person's private experiences without with that outside world so it's actually called as the introspectionist approach it's the approach in psychology which is called the science of consciousness so he looked into this approach and uh, during this period um uh, he understood that sensations is something that he wanted to study that is by measuring the sense of touch and he wanted to enrich this process by understanding uh how this can be measured now in the 1900s around the 1920s 30s uh the behaviorist approach had already come into being which was studying the stimulus response relationships which we covered under the learning videos so uh this came in much later the behaviorist approach came a little later we are looking at theodore's time where he wanted to understand the concept of touch and how he can relate uh the uh relationship how he can create a relationship between an organism and the objects around him and the interactions between them and he wanted to measure these interactions now uh fechner's work was later on in the 1900s and 1950s it was studied and extended by charles peirce another psychologist who was helped by one of fechner's students and both of them largely confirmed uh fechner's work and uh, they were very impressed by it so these were the he found a lot of older ways of trying to measure all of this now when we are looking at the current approaches to psychophysics we are looking at how a person a person's judgment can be measured from the stimulus that he interacts with so this is more or less like we can call it the subjective approach which came in after the 1900s and uh, there was a lot of research done on this so now uh, let's leave all the uh, uh grave details of the history behind and let's just focus on the sensations aspect this is something that we are going to be learning about in the further slides so when i say that um we're going to talk about measuring the sense of touch we're going to learn different methods in which uh, psych in the field of psychophysics uh sensation was measured by by uh, experiments uh wherein a person would have to uh, either uh, you know adjust a line or carry a few weights and then tell which one was heavier or lighter which is increasing or decreasing so we're trying to kind of uh, kind of analyze how much a person can differentiate between two stimuli and understand the uh depth of it so let's first uh understand the definition of psychophysics uh very quickly it's called uh it's called as the scientific study of relationships between physical stimuli and the responses evoked by those stimuli the responses given by you as a person so what responses are we looking at we're looking at sensations we're looking at perceptions by a person so the term psychophysics is used to denote both study of physical objects and uh, responses given by a person so psychophysics actually quantitatively looks at measuring this in numbers how physical stimuli in the environment can affect a person's responses the other definition is that it's uh the primary scientific tool for understanding how the physical world of shapes sounds colors odors movements etc translate into the sensory world that is our world how we perceive it in terms of light weight touch taste smell which are sensations so we are looking at how there is a relationship between these two things how the outside world and our experiences with the outside world translate and mean something to us and they mean something to us in terms of our five sense organs okay so um it's a process of analysis 
in the interaction between a subject's experience and uh, the behavior that stimuli elicit in the physical dimensions. Okay, so we're looking at a quantitative way of measuring these things of how much a stimuli we can detect, what kind of things we can see uh, or we can detect with all our, our sense organs and how we detect differences between two stimuli as well in our environment through our sensory systems. So um, Fechner set out the principles of psychophysics actually and he spoke about the theories under psychophysics using different experiments to map out the relationship between mind and matter. And although psychophysics is actually a methodology, it's also uh, a research area because a lot of uh, research has been done through these on these experiments. And a lot of time has been devoted to understand new psychological, new psychophysical techniques and new ways of understanding how to measure uh, data from our senses. So before I take you through the methods that are used in psychophysics to understand the relationships between our responses and the physical objects around us, I will first take you through the basic concepts that you need to know in terms of the terms used so that understanding the theories uh, in a few slides later becomes easier for you. So what concepts are we looking at now? Obviously, when I say, when, when you read the topic that uh, it's an introduction to psychophysics, uh, sensation we're talking about sensitivity now if you have to understand what that is uh, completely in theory you will have to first understand the basic concept so sensitivity in in layman's terms is the sharpness with which we can detect the presence of a stimuli in our environment so sensitivity is very acute and it's nothing but the capacity of your own sense organs to react or to respond to things around you. So the response is given after you detect a stimulus. It could be in terms of equality, like these two things look the same or feel the same or the response could be in terms of difference. These two, How do you differentiate between um, a cherry and a blueberry or a raspberry they, because they all come under the berry section. So, you know what I'm saying, like your, your, uh, the depth of processing in terms of differentiating objects, even that look or feel similar is that's what, uh, uh, is, uh, to be measured and to be studied in psychophysics. So sensitivity would obviously depend upon a few factors like, uh, for example, the capacity of your sense organs, how much can you see after a particular distance? And obviously, if you have specs, you would not be able to detect too much of distance without wearing your specs. So sensitivity would also depend upon the intensity of the stimulus which is given to you. If, if a photograph is shown to you, which is extremely blurred and uh, the question is, would you be able to understand whether that is a tree or whether that is a person in the distance? Uh, because of the blurred pre presentation of the, of the photograph, maybe you would not be able to sense it. So intensity of the stimulus is also an important factor. Also, under what environmental conditions has the stimulus been exposed to you? So if it's night time and you're asked to probably read something that's really far off and there's not enough lighting, would you be able to? Versus if you would be able to do that during the day. So a lot of factors affect sensitivity. Okay. And... Every organism, every person, every living thing is equipped with receptor organs, which are in your, the receptor points in your sense organs, which are specialized to respond to any change in the environment. So, for example, the receptors of your eyes are responsive to light within a certain range of wavelength, okay? Uh, the receptors of the ears are, can respond to sound waves. Again, it has a certain range of frequency. We cannot hear below and above a certain point and so on and so forth with different sense organs. So this action of your receptor organs uh, kind of makes a pattern of responses. There is a chain of responses which occurs between the stimulus and you 
and that is when you learn how to differentiate between two sounds two colors two things even minutely through a number of experiences so this capacity of your receptor organs of your sense organs and to respond to different physical stimulations in your environment is called sensitivity now we are going to look at two types of sensitivity which are given on the screen absolute and differential sensitivity now we are looking at uh, absolute sensitivity in a way where we must understand that it's the minimum intensity or the magnitude required by a person by a person's senses to detect the stimulus in something for example for example if i say um if i present a dish to you and i ask you is this salt in it okay uh, i am presenting a dish which actually has very less salt okay so and then i'm asking you to detect if you can still sense if there's salt in it now uh, if i add a pinch of salt to say um like half a kg of maybe a soup would you be able to detect the salt the taste i'm assuming a lot of you all would not be able to and why am i saying this why am i saying that you would not be able to because the proportion is too little for the stimulus for the presentation of the soup so there has to be some amount of salt in the soup for you to be able to detect but some people there will be some people who would be able to determine that there is salt in it so it's that minimum intensity that is required by you every person would have a different magnitude huh everybody i would have a different magnitude to judge whether there's salt in something and your mom would differently and you would differently so when i'm saying absolute sensitivity i am saying that i need a minimum amount of salt in the soup to be able to tell whether there is salt or not now for me it could be 5 grams for you it could be 10 grams for someone else it could be 12 grams so my minimum quantity that i need is about 4 to 5 grams to understand that oh there is salt in the food for you maybe you need a little more to judge that whether there is salt or not the same thing uh, would go for uh, when you when you have tea or coffee and some people say that i would like less so uh, sugar in my tea and your less may be more for someone else so because their absolute uh, sensitivity for sugar is still where they need lesser sugar and you need more sugar to understand that okay this is your limit if there was sugar any lesser than this you would feel that the tea is not sweet so are we understanding in a sense i just wanted you to remember two words when you have to understand absolute sensitivity it's the minimum amount of something a minimum intensity required by your sense organs to detect the stimulus and that is absolute sensitivity so it's the limits of a person's capacity to respond to a stimulus okay so there has to be a minimum amount of it to be able to be detected reliably by a person and that is absolute sensitivity sensitivity we're looking at differential sensitivity where we have to understand differences so it is actually a person's capacity to respond to differences both quantitative difference that is maybe in grams or whatever or qualitative like saying that oh it's little sweet or it's too sweet so we're looking at differences both quantitative and qualitative between two or more stimuli so we're differentiating that in this cup there is lesser and in this cup there's more more sugar okay so it's the minimum difference between two stimuli needed for a reliable um discrimination i would say so for example again the words that you need to remember for differential sensitivity is the minimum magnitude required by your sense organs to be able to differentiate between two different stimuli to be able to make a difference which is reliable enough okay so the first time uh, i uh, make you listen to a pitch which is at say 100 hertz 
the second time at 501 hertz you say oh it's still the same nothing has changed the third time i make it 502 hertz and you still think that the pitch is the same at 503 hertz there is a change in your reaction you say oh the pitch is slightly more this time so it was at 503 hertz units that you were able to understand that there is a difference between the first stimulus given and the second stimulus. You did not realize that 501, 2 in between were also different stimuli. So the minimum magnitude your senses required to find the difference was a difference of 3 units. Alright, this is a very simple example for you to be able to understand what is differential sensitivity. So in absolute sensitivity, it's just the minimum amount of uh, stimulus required to get a reaction out of you. And differential means we're looking at two objects. We're looking at two stimuli or two or more stimuli and for you to determine the differences between them. How much of difference there is. Okay. So every individual serves different responses to one stimulus, to any stimulus. So every individual has a different differential sensitivity just like every individual has a different absolute sensitivity and many factors are responsible to determine differential sensitivity okay so now let's move on to the next concept that you need to understand which is threshold now in common english language if i have to ask you what is the threshold what would you say like a lot of people say my threshold to tolerate nonsense is very low which means that I, I cannot, I can tolerate, but I don't really want to tolerate nonsense. Or a person would say that my threshold to uh, really tolerate loud noises is very high. That means I'm okay with people speaking loudly around me or I'm okay with a lot of loud music. I'm okay with uh, less privacy where I can hear somebody else speaking in my room, whatever, something like that. So threshold is the limit point for you at which you can either tolerate or not tolerate something. This is in layman terms. But now if I have to explain this to you in terms of <clears throat> psychology, how would you imagine me to explain this? So psychophysicists use a lot of experimental uh, stimuli, like using weights or using uh, different things, mostly weights, to objectively measure differences in intensity okay such as using a pure tone which can vary in intensity using lights which will vary in luminance and all our senses have been studied to understand threshold <coughs> vision hearing touch taste smell and even the sense of time has been studied and regardless of your sensory domain of all these five six senses there are two main areas of investigation there is absolute threshold and differential threshold. Now first we are going to understand what threshold is. Okay. So a threshold is the point of intensity at which you can just detect the presence or difference in a stimulus. It's not the minimum point. It's the point at which you can determine the presence of a stimulus. Okay, um, a minimum magnitude, we're talking about sensitivity, not about threshold. Now, stimuli with intensities below your threshold are considered not detectable. So, if I present something to you below 20 hertz, which is in normal humans, a lot of humans cannot hear, that, that's the range. 20 hertz and above is something through which we can hear. So, if I present something to you below 20 hertz, you will not be able to hear it. So that's what I'm saying. Stimuli with intensities which are below a normal threshold is not detectable. They will not be able to be detected. But there are stimuli with values which are close enough to a threshold where you will be able to detect it at some point in time. And therefore, that threshold is considered to be the point at which you can detect that stimulus at least 50% of the time. That is what I'm saying when I say threshold. Your ability to be able to detect uh, a stimulus's presence or the difference between two stimuli at at least 50 to 60% of the time. That is your threshold. 
okay sometimes you would be able to tolerate a lot of noise and your threshold sometimes would be different that's why i'm saying that 50 to 60 percent of the time your threshold for the same stimulus might vary okay so let's dig into the types right now absolute and differential now in psychophysics an absolute threshold is the smallest detectable level of a stimulus the smallest uh, amount of stimulus uh, that is detectable by you is absolute threshold but at this this low level people will sometimes detect the stimulus and sometimes they will not be able to detect the stimulus so the same way i'm saying that you would probably prefer um your music to be playing at a certain volume number when you're riding your bike or you're driving your car but if i lower it down on on some occasions you would be able to hear your music most of the times maybe at 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 if it's you have a scale of 0 to 8 maybe mostly at 2 it will be very soft on some occasions on some occasions even 2 even the volume at 2 would be undetectable to you maybe because you've you're too stressed out or you've you've already come from an even noisier environment so what i'm saying is 2 would be minimum for you for you to be able to listen to the sound of that music that song but in absolute threshold we are saying that 50% of the times you would be able to detect that stimulus and at other times you would not be able to so therefore uh, another way to understand this is the lowest intensity at which a stimulus can be detected 50% of the time is called your absolute threshold now absolute threshold like i again told you can be influenced by a lot of factors like your motivation your mood your expectation the environment around you and <coughs> your state of mind and uh, absolute thresholds for vision hearing and odor have been uh, studied quite a lot <clears throat> so uh, in neuroscience and psychology it is considered as the lowest possible level of a detected stimulus so you were able to detect music was going on you were able to detect music at the lowest level which was two for you on some days maybe at two you would not be able to detect it maybe four would be your lowest level if i put it at two maybe you would not be able to hear it that day so that's your absolute absolute threshold for that day okay now uh, let's um <coughs> look at differential threshold now in psychophysics uh, there is something called as a jnd that is a just noticeable difference and that is the smallest amount of difference you can detect between the starting and the second level of a stimulus so it is known as a differential threshold that is the uh, the just about the amount of difference you need to understand that one stimulus is different from the other so this is more or less a fixed proportion it's like a reference between two stimuli that uh, i would need uh, suppose you want to color or you want to redo your room and you want to repaint your room right so you use a shade of cream and eggshell now, if you actually read up on the color paints, I'm, I'm sure different companies again have different names, but this is something personally that I had gone through. Okay, and I would like to explain it to you that way. That I wanted to look at whether my room wall should have been green, cream or eggshell. And there is a difference between the two. But when I was presented it on, on that card, that laminate card kind of a thing, I could not make out the difference. But when I was shown the paint with the distempers, I could make out that there was a very, very, very minute difference between the two. Even the texture was a little different and the, the color, the, um, what would I say, like the shade was different. It was not a different color, it was just a different shade. It was the same color, it was cream. But eggshell had a little more tinge of uh, the yellowness in it 
so it is this amount of just this amount of noticeable difference that i needed to understand that both these stimuli are different and that was my differential threshold so i hope uh, understanding differential threshold was easy for you now it is very much possible to quantify and measure jnd different just dif noticeable difference which is also called as differential threshold in a statistical manner uh and from trial to trial the difference that a given person notices can vary so on another day in another set of lighting environment or maybe by another company the cream and the eggshell colors or the shades would not be the same as the first company so sometimes this jnd may remain the same and sometimes the just not noticeable difference would vary and therefore it is necessary to conduct many trials that means for me to see it many times to be able to understand whether they are different or not that's when i understood my differential threshold for it and more around like it's the same thing the jnd the the differential threshold would mostly have the same response 50% of the time and the other 50% of the time your differential threshold would vary and probably you would say these are not the same two colors or this is not eggshell and this is not cream this is some different color altogether so that generally happens so i hope sensitivity and thresholds are clear to you uh, it's more important for you to understand what is sensitivity and what is threshold the rest with the examples that i've narrated you can listen to the whole video again and just come back and understand absolute and differential and the differences between the two okay let's move on to the third basic concept which is point of subjective equality it's also called as a pse so i'm just going to say pse because it's pretty long to use the whole concept now pse is also a magnitude or a point at which a person will equate a comparative stimulus to a standard stimulus so for example uh, you're a person and i'm presenting you with weights of different magnitudes okay like one is uh, for example i say like um one is 60 grams 80 grams 100 grams 120 grams 140 grams my standard weight is 100 grams okay because it comes right in the center there are two sets of weights which are below 100 which is 60 and 80 and two sets of weight above 100 that's 120 and 140 so it's a uniform setup every 20 grams there is an increase in the weight presented to you so on an average okay uh, by constantly presenting uh and doing this in a combination of trials i realize that you are a person who would say that 80 grams is equal to 100 grams on a number of trials so first i'll present the standard stimulus of 100 to you then i'll give you 60 grams you'll say oh no this is lighter okay it's not the same this this one that i picked up the second time is definitely lighter then i give you 140 grams you say this is definitely heavier then i give you 120 grams you'll say this is still heavier so i'll give you 100 grams then i'll give you 60 grams you say this is light then i keep both down then i give you the 100 grams again then i give you 140 grams you say 140 grams is definitely heavier i keep them down again i give you 100 grams to sense that this is 100 grams and then you have to judge based on what i just carried this one what i've given you now is it heavier or lighter so i've given you 120 you say oh no it's still heavier then i again give you 100 grams and randomly maybe i give you 60 grams again or let's see that let me give you 80 grams this time this time you say that oh no this is the same so when you make that error uh and this is not an error as a mistake when this is your difference okay so on an average uh with a number of trials and combinations the you as a person you have equated 80 grams to the standard of 100 grams so 80 grams is the point of subjective equality for you 80 grams is the magnitude at which you have equated the 80 gram um cylinder small little wooden cylinder or let's say a metal cylinder to a 100 gram standard stimulus cylinder so on, on many trials basically what i'm trying to say on many trials on many combinations you have said that 80 grams is equal to 100 grams and on some trials you have said that 120 grams is equal to 100 grams but you've mostly said that 120 grams is uh heavier so i'm just going to stick to 80 is equal to 100 so your responses have come out in this pattern and that is your point of subjective equality 
that is the point at which you said that these two stimuli are equal these two subjects are equal so that means point of subjective equality that's what it means and this point of subjective equality can be uh, measured by method of limits and method of constant stimuli which we will be studying right after this okay so i hope this is pretty pretty easy to you it's it's really not difficult at all and uh, this is one of the easiest concepts that uh, comes under psychophysics okay another example i could say is 10 centimeters thread i give you and that's your standard stimulus that remains constant so first i show you the 10 centimeter thread then i give you a uh, five different threads of different lengths uh, first i give you an 8 centimeter thread you say this is the same then I give you 6 centimeters and you say this is less. Then I show you 5 centimeters you say this is less. I show you 11.5 you say oh this is more. And you get stuck at 8 centimeters every time. Maybe sometimes you give me a different response. You say no no this is this is less. 8 centimeters is lesser than 10. But on most of the times you have said that 8 centimeters wala thread is as equal to the 10 centimeter standard thread that I keep showing you. So your point of subjective equality is that every time... I showed you the 8 centimeter thread, which you didn't know was 80 centimeters. You just had to say whether it was smaller or larger. Because if I gave you the numbers, you would know which one is smaller or larger. Right? You're just detecting through your eyes. You cannot measure the thread. That is the point at which you have your subjective equality. So basically, you underestimated the length of the 10 centimeter thread by 2 centimeters. So that's what we're talking about. Okay? Then we have types of errors okay types of errors that we see in psychophysics now when i say error i'm not referring to a mistake i'm talking about difference i'm talking about difference and i will explain this to you uh, first let's look at the first error which is called as a variable error now uh, when a subject responds when a person responds repeatedly to the same stimulus his judgments may not be the same Every time the stimulus is presented. So if I, I kept giving you 10 centimeters, 8 centimeters, 8 centimeters, 8 centimeters. There were some times where you said that 8 centimeters is probably, this thread is probably smaller than that main thread. But maximum times you said that it was equal. Now this variability is because of changes in your judgment. Okay, and it's sometimes difficult for you to understand why my judgments are varying for the same thread. So the subjects or the person's sensitivity can vary from moment to moment. And there are some small unavoidable changes in the physical environment of a person which can affect your responses to the stimulus. These factors are actually called types of errors. So let's look at the first one, variable error. It is the degree to which your judgment will differ from trial to trial and, a, and an index of uh, this judgment can be calculated. That is called the amount of variable error. So it's the degree to which your judgment would change from trial to trial. So your, your variable error in, in this previous thing was you kept saying 8 centimeters equal, this thread is equal to the 10 centimeter thread. So that was uh, the degree to which your judgment kept deferring. How many times it deferred? Maybe we had 21 trials. Uh, maybe we had 100 trials together and there were 32 trials for uh, giving you the 8 centimeter thread. Out of those 32 trials, um, let's say 22 times you said that 8 centimeter thread is equal to 10 centimeter thread. That's your variable error. Because you're doing it again and again and again and after a point you can't make out the difference. And there are some times because I've shown you bigger threads, suddenly that 8 centimeter thread looks smaller. So that's called variable error, right? And um, I'm hoping this is uh, uh, clear to you. So there are fluctuations which will cause uh, changes in your responses. And uh, your responses does not have a particular systematic direction. Sometimes you'll give me the correct answer, sometimes you'll give me the wrong answer. So this would depend on the th trend or the attitude of the person who is giving the responses in the experiment. Okay. Now constant error is 
very simple it's constant so it's a tendency it's a systematic tendency on behalf of you as a person to overestimate or underestimate a stimulus so this is called as a constant error so uh, let me give you an example of um, constant error to make it a little more clear to you all right now any reproduction of a physical stimulus uh, of one stimulus will not correspond to the other physical stimulus so if i give you like i told you i'll give you a 100 gram weight uh, <clears throat> and you look at it your psychological reproduction means your psychological answer is uh, okay let give me another weight let me tell you if it is ha uh, heavier or lighter but if i give you a weight which is too close to the main weight too close in in grams or uh, in grams to the main weight sometimes you would not be able to tell the difference because maybe they look similar so i have given you two weights one of 200 grams one of 170 grams okay you've lifted both before lifting you look at both of them and you say these look the same but after you pick them up you say one is slightly heavier than the other so this is because your physical dimensions cannot find the exact correlation for what you thought psychologically because of the limitations of your sense organs so when you saw with your eyes you thought they were the same when you lifted it with your hands you felt there was a difference and because sometimes these characteristics don't match errors can occur so constant error actually refers to the amount of error that you produce in adjusting the variable stimulus and to equalize it to that standard stimulus and this is called the constant error so the constant error will always show a systematic pattern in the person to either underestimate or overestimate the standard stimulus value so underestimating means i'm saying that it's lighter okay or i'm saying that it's shorter and with the thread thing you underestimated the length and with the weight when when if you said that 120 grams was equal to 100 grams you would have overestimated the weight so that is a constant error where you keep saying that um, definitely this weight cannot be uh, uh, heavier. It's probably equal to the standard weight. So that's constant error. And constant error can also be um, measured. Now let's look at time error. Okay. Uh, if two identical stimuli like for example A and B are presented to you. Okay. In succession. Like first I show you A. Then I show you B. And if I find out that for different time intervals, there is a systematic tendency to underestimate or overestimate the second stimulus, then there is a time error. Now, I don't know if you caught the, the, the keywords that I just, uh, from, from what I just spoke. I said that I'm presenting two identical stimuli to you. Identical means they're the same. They're exactly the same in height, in weight, in physical presence as well, in, in physical features as well. First, I present to you the first stimulus. Then I you take a good look at it. You and then take it away. Then I show you the second stimulus. But you say that the second stimulus is either bigger or smaller than the first one or lighter or heavier than the first one or whatever you want to say, however the response is required. So it's your tendency the constant the constant error that you make that when you're saying that it's lesser or it's more that's called as underestimation or overestimation that is called a time error <clears throat> so in in um, if i have to kind of break it down to you i this error has actually occurred because i have presented it to you at different times And you've not been able to realize that it was probably, it's the same, uh, there are two different stimuli, but it's the same with the same features. So because of a time error, you thought that they are, one is either heavier or lighter than the other. You could not make out that it was identical. That's a time error. Okay. Um, also, we have a space error, but uh, <clears throat> before I uh, explain space error to you, let me tell you that um, 
sometimes when you're given two objects and they're given one after the other there is a possibility that the process is going on during that time in your mind between the presentation of the first one and the second one will influence the judgment so i give you uh, stimulus a or weight a uh, say in the first minute and after about you looking at it for uh, you know maybe like 20 30 seconds and take it away and uh, there is a 20 minute gap 20 second gap of presenting the next stimulus to you that 20 second gap has probably influenced or affected your response for the next wait that is called a time error it's because of the gap in time between the presentation of two stimuli that you gave out probably an incorrect answer. So that's how we're going to look at time errors. So it's the length of time uh, interval between two stimuli which is important to determine the time error. Okay, now when we're saying uh, space error, we are saying that judgments can be, your judgments and understanding differences can be influenced by the spatial position of the stimuli, whether they are on the right side or on the left side. So this, this would be a space error. So if I place the same object first on the right, you would say that, uh, oh yeah, this is that 200 gram wala weight. And the moment I place it on the left and place a 180 gram on the right, you inverse it or you say something else. Purely because I have changed the spatial position of placing that stimulus, you make an error in your response. You forget about looking at all the features of it, checking how heavy it is and all of that, just by looking at the position change in the position of the, uh, of the stimulus given, uh, you give a different response and that is called as a space error. And the last one is movement error. So uh, obviously, Movement error is uh, will occur because of an inward or an outward movement made by you to adjust, uh, let's say, the length of a line in sensation. So I give you like a 7 centimeter line in front of you and there is this kind of a small little section that you have to push and push either towards right or left or inward or outward. So you're trying to adjust. You don't know the centimeters below. You don't know the centimeters above. Only I know from the other side. And the scale is not given to you. And you're constantly adjusting the uh, scale to try to adjust the second length to the first length. Now, due to this pushing and pushing towards this side, pushing towards this side or inward or outward movement, due to the movement of your hand constantly to make these adjustments, you make an error in the length of the variable. So it is due to the inward and outward movements made by you in adjusting the length of the uh, second line that I keep on changing to match the first line. This produces differences in sensation. So these are the types of errors that we have covered which can affect your responses to understanding when two uh, stimuli are different or the same. Okay, and the last part that we're now going to focus on is methods of psychophysics. So we have methods of limit, uh, methods of average error and methods of constant stimuli. These are the three methods used and given by, um, given by Fechner to study psychophysics, to calculate uh, absolute threshold, differential threshold, absolute sensitivity, differential sensitivity, to calculate point of subjective equality and constant errors, constant and variable errors. So to calculate all these basic concepts, these methods have been given to you. So we're not going to uh, look at how to calculate these things. I'm just going to tell you how these methods are different from each other and what kind of experiments were done. Okay, let's move to the first one, which is the method of average error or adjustment. Now, um, uh, this is actually a figure from my journal uh, four years back from uh, rather five, six years back. Uh, when I five years back when I did this uh, experiment so basically this is called the Galton bar uh, apparatus both the diagrams that you see it's uh, erected on two stands on either sides and there is a huge 
uh, bar with a scale inside it on one side and on one side the uh, experimenter or the uh, person who is doing the experiment can see what the subject is how the subject is adjusting the line so when i said movement error it applies to this movement error occurs a lot with a uh, method of average error experiment because on the other side the subject is constantly adjusting and creating a line which is similar to the given line to him a given line segment <clears throat> so actually uh, in the figure there is a red line in the figure that i have drawn and shown you there is a red line which indicates uh that error over here so but uh, maybe you can go back to your department and just check for this apparatus um i think uh, ty students would have done this uh, experiment it is a ty uh, it is a ty class experiment so now what are we looking at in the method of average error or adjustment now this method is actually used to determine the average amount of errors a person makes in his judgments for the value of a stimuli so in using this method uh, an experimenter would repeatedly present so i suppose i am the experimenter i repeatedly present to you you are my subject a stimulus of a fixed or a constant value so i am giving you 7 cm this is called your this is your standard stimulus it doesn't change and i i present this together with a variable stimulus whose value can be changed either by increasing or decreasing it so there is a little uh, kind of a projection on that and you you have to hold that projection and either slide it left or right or inward or outward to adjust and to make it equal to 7 cm so uh, this is your comparison stimulus now what are you required to do you are supposed to adjust this second length either by increasing or decreasing its magnitude till it appears equal to you so first you can see 7 cm on your side you can't see the number 7 cm you can see a length which will never change i uh, even you or i we cannot change that length it's just given on top what i keep changing every time is on the other side i have a scale okay there i can see that below the standard stimulus there is a scale sometimes i'll give you 7.8 sometimes i'll give you 6.4 sometimes i'll give you 6.8 or 6.9 very close to 7 cm and i'll ask you chalo now move it left right and adjust it till on your side the 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 line segment on top which you can see is equal to what you are adjusting so you have to keep adjusting accordingly only i can see where that little ledge is moving because on my side there are prints on the scale on your side there are no prints of 1 cm 2 cm on the scale you are all doing it by your judgment and your attention so this is the method of average error and what are we looking at in this method now this is the experiment and uh, the difference in the values of your standard stimulus that is 7 cm and the values what you keep giving in your comparison stimulus that appears equal to you will give me an estimate of the error in judgment made by you so i take an average which means i take a mean mean which is average of all the differences obtained from different trials provided by you and since you as a subject have adjusted the value of the comparative stimulus to the value of the standard stimulus and you've said oh this is equal it is also called as method of adjustment that's why it's called method of adjustment sometimes the standard uh, 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 stimulus alone is presented so i'm just giving you 7 cm and i'm asking you as a subject what it is so after a number of times that you take to understand that mean a mean uh, difference is taken of all the answers that you have given and then i'll be able to estimate that on an average what is your error of trying to create equality between um, the main standard stimulus and the um, comparative stimulus so this method is called method of average error or method of adjustment and it is also sometimes called as method of reproduction okay so um, it is actually the on average on an average the amount of error you make in your judgment of adjusting 
the standard stimulus and this uh, stimulus that keeps changing which is called the comparative stimulus so that is the average amount of error that you make every time you judge that oh it's equal right now oh it's not equal let me adjust it a little more and that's what i'm talking about <clears throat> So, um, the difference in the value of the 7 centimeters, which is standard, and the values of all the comparison that appears equal to you. So, every time you said, uh, suppose out of 20 trials, on 8 trials, when I gave you 6.8, 6.9, 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, you have said that, oh, this is equal now. You have adjusted it and you have said this is equal to 7 centimeters. So all those number of times I take from your trials, because I know that it was these number of times when you said that uh, it, seven, this what appears on top appears equal to what I have created. Actually, it's wrong because I know on this side that it's 6.9, it's not 7 or it's 6.8. So I take out those trials where you have given me answers saying that this length is equal to what is presented to me all the time. I take a mean of all these answers and then I give you an understanding that this value shows the average error you have made on these trials. So that's method of average error. When you do the experiment, you will completely understand how to compute and understand the difference and how to understand the constant error, how to uh, calculate the PSE and all of that. I'm just explaining the experiment to you. That's all you need to know. Now, the second one is um, the method of limits or minimal changes. Now, this is the diagram. Okay. There is a box with a lot of weights. Okay. That's called the, those are all the comparative weights. And uh, you see an empty slot or two empty slots. That's actually the constant stimulus. So, maybe if the constant stimulus say is 200 grams, in the box, there are maybe 2, 3, 200 grams, 2, 3, 180 grams, 2, 3, 220 grams, 2, 3, 160 grams, and 2, 3, 240 grams. Okay. Now, this is principally used to, again, check your differential threshold or your absolute threshold. So, what I'm doing here is I'm presenting. First, I give you, uh, I, I keep the 200 grams in front of you. I ask you. To use only one hand, I, I don't ask you to change your hands. I ask you to use whichever hand you want, say right hand. You have to pick it up with one finger. Like put your finger through the through this loop here, pick it up and keep it down after a few seconds. You don't know the weight. Only I know that it's 200, 180 and all that. You don't know the weight at all. And I keep telling you, this is your constant stimulus. This will never change. This I never keep inside the box. This always stays outside. Okay. And then the weights are actually written at the bottom, but the subject is standing, so he cannot see the weight. And then I give you another random, uh, this thing, another random uh, weight from the box, which is actually kept behind the box. I know that it's 180 grams. I pick it up and give it to you. Okay. Then you lift that weight. This is your one trial where you've lifted the constant weight. You've lifted the comparative weight. And now I'm asking you, is the comparative weight heavier or lighter? And you give me a response. Now, I know that in my paper, it's 180 and I've removed the 180 weight and given to you. If you say it's lighter, I will just put a tick mark. If you say it's heavier, I'll put a cross. If you say it's equal, again, I'll put a cross. So, I keep on doing these number of trials. Okay. Um, till the point I, uh, you, are, you are required to respond that you have perceived the variable stimulus, one of those from the box, to be equal to the standard stimulus. So I can either give this to you right from an increasing order, like I, I, I start from a descending order, I start giving you the heaviest of weights to the lightest of weights, and you have to tell me which one is equal to the standard weight, or I give you from the lightest of weights to the heaviest of weight, and from that, those presentation trials, you will tell me which is the equal weight. So in this method, me, I as an experimenter, I will present the comparative stimulus to you alternatively, sometimes in the ascending order, sometimes in the descending order. And you are required to respond to the value where you think that there is a transition in the judgment. There is a change in the presentation of the stimulus. This is called the methods of minimal change because I as an experimenter present 
different stimuli to you by bringing out minimal changes in the value or the magnitude. So it's a minimal change, right? It's 20 grams. Sometimes I give you, uh, I will, I will give you 180. Sometimes I will give you 160. After 180, again, I will probably give you 200. After 200, I will give you 240. I cannot jump from 160 to 240. It will be too obvious for you. So I will use minimal amount of uh, changes in the grams, minimal uh, presentations of uh, the weight of these uh, of these weights for you to understand whether it's heavier or lighter. So this is done in a serial order by either increasing or decreasing the magnitude gradually. Therefore, it's also called as method of limits or method of minimal change. It's also called as a serial production method. So this is the method of limits, actually. <clears throat> so again, when you do the experiment, you will be able to understand uh, how to uh, understand how this how, how, how this uh, method has been able to gauge or to measure my sensitivity and my thresholds. And this method of limits is actually a very simple procedure and it's very frequently used for understanding uh, differential threshold or uh, absolute threshold. So I gradually keep increasing the variable stimulus and I gradually keep decreasing it in a particular order and you you have to keep giving me responses of where uh, it's equal and where it has changed. <clears throat> the next one and the last one is called the method of constant stimuli or method of frequency. Now here we are looking at uh, the comparison and the standard stimulus. Both are presented before you side by side or one after the other in random order for equal number of times. So you see 200 is a stand. There are not too many weights here. You see it's a rotating stand. I'll keep rotating it. Uh, uh, these weights I have written on the on the weights but they are actually written below. So they stay on the uh, rotating stand. The subject can't see them. Again 200 which is the standard stimulus given to the subject cannot be seen that it's 200. It's just given that this is, has XYZ weight and I'm going to keep rotating, taking out one one um, uh, weight and keeping it down. You have to kind of lift it with your finger and you have to tell me whether it's equal or not. So in this method, I will give you the variable standard stimulus will be kept down. You have to lift it and uh, I will present both before you in any random order and equal number of times. So I will give 192 grams, say five times, two, 208 grams, five times, 200 grams, five times, 184 grams, also five times and 216 grams, also five times. So equal number of times, I will give you uh, repeatedly all the weights. Each time the standard stimulus is presented. I will give you another comparative stimulus and these two stimuli I will keep altering in a random sequence and you have to give me the correct answer. Now uh, you as a subject you are required to respond whether the first stimulus uh, whether the stimulus that I gave you, the sorry, the second stimulus that I gave you the second time, whether it is smaller in magnitude, equal or larger in magnitude as compared to the given value. So when the method, uh, uh, this method is called as actually the method of constant stimuli difference or the method of frequency. So you will keep lifting this 200 grams. I will just give you say supposing 192 grams. I'll say lift it. Then I, I, I give you 200 grams which is the standard stimuli. I say lift it. You're going to tell me whether this 200 grams which is the standard when you lift it whether it was heavier or lighter than the previous one. So you are actually uh, changing your responses every time for the standard stimulus. Sometimes you're saying it's heavier. Sometimes things you're lighter. And your responses would change every single time. That is the constant uh, uh, 
error that you're making time and again so these are a few different ways to actually measure um, the uh, understanding how much of strength you have and <clears throat> how much of uh, ability you have to differentiate between different senses in terms of light in terms of length in terms of weight etc so um, let's move on to the next and the last part um, so this brings us to the laws of psychophysics and there are two laws uh, the first law is the Weber's law and Weber is the person by whom Fechner was uh, quite influenced by. Now to explain this law to you, I'll explain it in a very, very simple way. Uh, if we add 10 candle power lights, okay, to a 100 candle power light, the difference by you will be perceived. Okay, so I present a 100 CP, CP is candle power. Yeah, I present to you a 100 CP light and you are able to judge the light with your eyes and the intensity of it. And I add 10 CPs to it. You are able to make out the difference. When the same CP is added to a 500 CP light, this the difference obviously cannot be perceived, right? Because it's 500 CPs. I'm just adding 10 CPs to it. So you're not able to make out the difference. So this phenomenon was explained by Weber. Why does this happen? So honestly, he said that in comparing magnitude, it is not arithmetical differences, but it is a ratio of magnitude which will help the subject, that is you as a person, to understand, to perceive whether there is a difference or not. Which means that, let me put it again in this example format, you'll be able to understand. Which means that if a 10 CP light is required to be added to 100 CP light for you to make out the difference. Key from 110, it's become 100. From 100, it has become 110. Then I cannot add 10 CPs to a 500 CP light bulb. I have to add 50 CPs. 50 CPs will be required to be added to a 500 CP bulb to perceive the difference. So it is in, in forms of multiplication. If I add uh, 5 grams, if I add 5 grams to a 50 gram weight and when I add those 5 grams, you say yes, now it is heavier. To a 100 gram weight, I cannot add 5 grams. I have to add twice that because I have increased the uh, weight of the first weight, right? From 50 grams, I'm, I am now using 100 grams. So just by adding 5 grams, what I added to the 50 gram weight, I am not, I should not be expecting you to say, oh, this is 105, it's heavier. I should be adding 10 grams more to it. And if I give you a 200 gram weight, I should be adding 20 grams weight more to be able to allow you to say that, yes, this is heavier. Now it is heavier. So in this arithmetical pattern, I have to be able to give you that much space and that much difference for you to be able to understand the magnitude of difference. This is called the just noticeable difference, which I already explained. So this difference to any stimulus is a constant ratio between the standard stimulus and the value of the other stimulus that you tell me. So the increase in this is always proportional to the size of the, of the stimulus. So when I add 1 gram to 20 grams of water, what I have to do for you to understand that, okay, this, this water weight has increased by 1 gram. When I'm giving you 80 grams of water, I cannot add 1 gram to it immediately after that. You will not be, you will say, no, it's still the same. I have to add 4 grams of water to, for you to elicit the same response. That would be uh, helpful for you to make the difference perceivable. So Weber has given a few ratios for uh, weights lifted by hand, a length of the lines, brightness of light, hearing, pressure on the skin, different kinds of ratios where the stimulus has to be given in, in a particular ratio and how much it has to be changed. So, um, 
uh, that's that for the Weber's law and he said that that's how it works that uh, when we talk about um, you know uh, allowing a subject to give a different answer and we want to elicit a correct answer we have to be increasing the weight accordingly again if I if I tell you that um, uh, let me give you another example if I say that um, Mm. okay uh, so I have you have um, first lifted uh, <clears throat> 200 gram standard weight okay and uh, I add a little sand in it of 20 more grams and I close the lid and I give you the cylinder again you have to pick it up you will say yes it's heavier because I ha I know I have added 20 grams to it. Next, I give you a 400 gram cylinder of sand. You're picking it up with your hand. Okay. Again, now I am adding only 20 grams to it. Now it's 400. It's already heavier. Your hand recently experienced picking up only a 200 gram weight. Now your, your hand is experiencing picking up a 400 gram cylinder. So if I add only 20 grams to it, uh, I'm not going to be able to judge the difference. I have to add 40 grams to it in order to allow you to give me a correct response. So that's what Weber said that we have to, for a person's uh, difference to be noted consistently, there has to be consistent increase in that ratio as well. Otherwise, the person will constantly give wrong responses. So that is Weber's law. Now, Fechner's law was slightly different from Weber's law. Okay, Fechner uh, noticed the flaws in Weber's law and he modified this. And according to him, he, he said that the sensations do not increase based on the increase in stimulus. So if I increase the weight of the stimulus, I'm not, I, I can't say that your, your responses will be accurate. For example, if I add 3 grams, 3 grams to a 50 gram weight, the difference is perceived, uh, you, you understand the difference, okay? You, you're like, okay, fine, there is, there is an increase in the weight, okay? Then I give you <clears throat> a 1000 gram weight, uh, sorry, a 100 gram weight and I add 6 grams to it. Now, it is not necessary that because I added the double of 3 grams, which is 6 grams, to the double of 50 grams, which is 100 grams, you have given me the correct answer. I'm not saying that you will deliver the exact same difference again. So Fechner said that all our psychological processes, that is all our sensory processing, runs slower than the physical processes that are taking place in front of us. So just because I'm changing the stimulus every time, it doesn't mean that because I change it systematically, my responses will also be exact and accurate. Psychological processes are uh, something that we can't really monitor because you never know in that experiment whether the person is hungry or he's thirsty or he's tired. It can influence his responses. So he stated that while the sensation increases according to arithmetical progression, that means I've increased arithmetically, I've given you exactly from 3 grams, I've increased to 6 grams when I give you a 100 gram weight. So... The stimulus value increases according to geometric progression. We use geometric aspects to understand differences. We don't look at arithmetic. Now, did you know all this while that when I was giving you a 200 gram weight, did you even know that was 200 grams? No. When I gave you 180 after that for the second trial to pick up, you told me that it was lesser. And on some, on some uh, different trials, when I give you 180 grams, you said, no, it's equal. Why did you say that? Because geometrically it probably appeared or by weight it sort of felt that it was lighter or it was the same. So we look at, when we are using our senses, we don't look at numbers. We can't look at the arithmetic uh, uh, dimensions of in, the, in such experiments. We, we go according to geometric progressions. We go according to shape. We go according to weight. We go according to the position, how it looks, how it's kept. So thus the value of two stimuli which can be barely perceived is most of the times not a constant. 
So Fechner stated that by multiplying the stimuli magnitude again and again by constant value, it does not mean that we will get the correct sensation as an answer. So while the sensation increases by the process of adding, that means in arithmetically we are increasing the grams, the stimulus value will, will increase not in terms of giving the correct answer that okay you've increased it by 3 grams. You will give me a geometrical understanding. So when the stimulus increases geometrically, that means in if, if I give you a bigger shape of the weight, if I give you a lighter, a lighter weight of the shape, that is when you will give me a correct answer. If I just keep the shape the same, the color the same, the size the same, everything is the same but the weight is varying, uh, I cannot expect every time my subject to give me the correct answer. And this is what he rectified from Weber's law. So basically he defied Weber's law and said that this arithmetical pattern does not work with humans because humans firstly don't know the length, weight or whatever of the object presented to them. They are judging and giving you answers based on few sensory organs which are telling them this is the color of it, this must be similar. This is the weight of it, it must be similar. This is how it tastes, it both must be salty, both must be equal amount of salt. It's all in approximations because we don't know the arithmetical values of it. We are going by the geometrical values of it. So that's that about psychophysics. Um, I'm I'm guessing that the, uh, that a lot of uh, maybe a lot of concepts. I'm hoping that a lot of concepts were clear. But I'm I'm sort of positive that y'all will have doubts about this. I would say, uh, apart from my video, uh, refer to some books in your psychology department. Uh, take a look at the apparatus that I showed you in figures and explain to you and ask some of your seniors who are in TY or who are in ME1 and 2 how this experiment was done. You will have a better understanding of it. So uh, after doing all of that research yourself, if you still feel that there are doubts and you've not understood something, please feel free to call and uh, to put in your doubts uh, as per your requirement. Um, I am sure that all the SY students are going to do this, uh, ex these experiments in the TY, so it will become clear to you. But um, do speak to a few TYs, but if, this, if there is no access to anybody in the department or the apparatus, you can definitely contact me and we can discuss your doubts. Thank you for being attentive and um, this is all for this session.